Aker was first depicted as the torso of a recumbent lion with a widely opened mouth. Later, he was depicted as two recumbent lion torsos merged with each other and still looking away from each other. From Middle Kingdom onwards Aker appears as a pair of twin lions, one named Duage, meaning yesterday, and the other Sefer, meaning tomorrow. Aker was thus often titled he who's looking forward and behind. When depicted as a lion pair, a hieroglyphic sign for horizon and a sun disk was put between the lions, the lions were sitting back on back. Aker was first described as one of the earth gods guarding the gate to the yonder site. He protected the deceased king against the three demonic snakes Hemtet, Ikaru, and Jag. By encircling the deceased king, Aker sealed the deceased away from the poisonous breath of the snake demons. Another earth deity, who joined and promoted Aker's work, was Geb. Thus, Aker was connected with Geb. In other spells and prayers, Aker is connected with Seth and even determined with the set animal. This is interesting, because Seth is described as a wind deity, not as an earth deity. In the famous coffin texts of Middle Kingdom period, Aker replaces the god Curdy, becoming now the ferryman of R.A. in his nocturnal bark. Aker protects the sun god during his nocturnal traveling through the underworld caverns. In the famous Book of the Dead, Aker also gives birth to the god Kepri, the young, rising sun in the shape of a scarab beetle, after Aker has carried Kepri's sarcophagus safely through the underworld caverns. In other underworld scenes, Aker carries the nocturnal bark of R.A. During his journey, in which Aker is asked to hide the body of the dead Osiris beneath his womb, Aker is protected by the god Geb. In several inscriptions, wall paintings and reliefs, Aker was connected to the horizon of the north and the west, forming a mythological bridge between the two horizons with his body. Certain sarcophagus texts from the tombs of Ramesses IV, Pediamenopit describe how the sun god R.A. travels through the underworld like Apophis going through the belly of Aker after Apophis was cut by Seth. In this case, Aker seems to be some kind of representation of the underworld itself. Amit Devourer of the Dead, also rendered Amit or Ahemate, was a goddess in ancient Egyptian religion with the forequarters of a lion, the hindquarters of a hippopotamus, and the head of a crocodile, the three largest man-eating animals known to ancient Egyptians. Amit is a creature sometimes depicted as attending the judgment of the soul, judgment of the dead, before Osiris, chapter 125 of Book of the Dead. Osiris presided over the judgment as the ruler of Duit, the Egyptian underworld, in the depictions during the New Kingdom and judgment took place in the Hall of the Two Truths. Anubis, the guardian of the scales, conducted the dead towards the weighing instrument, so that the heart of the dead can be weighed against the feather, d, of Ma'at, the goddess of truth. If the heart was judged to be impure, Amit would devour it, and the person undergoing judgment was not allowed to continue their voyage towards Osiris and immortality. Once Amit swallowed the heart, the soul was believed to become restless forever, this was called to die a second time. Thus Amit is often depicted sitting in a crouched posture near the scale, ready to eat the heart. However, the Book of the Dead served as both guide and guarantee, so that the dead buried with it always succeeded in the trial, leaving Amit ever hungry, and the consecrated dead was then able to bypass the lake of fire. Amun reconstructed as was a major ancient Egyptian deity who appears as a member of the Hermopolitan Ogdoad. Amun was attested from the Old Kingdom together with his wife Amunet. With the 11th dynasty, c. 21st century BC, Amun rose to the position of patron deity of Thebes by replacing Montu. After the rebellion of Thebes against the Hyksos and with the rule of Amos I, 16th century BC, Amun acquired national importance, expressed in his fusion with the sun god, Are, as Amun Are. Amun Are retained chief importance in the Egyptian pantheon throughout the New Kingdom, with the exception of the Aetnist period under Akhenaten. Amun Are in this period, 16th to 11th centuries BC, held the position of transcendental, self-created creator deity par excellence. He was the champion of the poor or troubled and central to personal piety. With Osiris, 
Amun-Re is the most widely recorded of the Egyptian gods. As the chief deity of the Egyptian empire, Amun-Re also came to be worshipped outside Egypt, according to the testimony of ancient Greek historiographers in Libya and Nubia. As Zeus Ammon, he came to be identified with Zeus in Greece. When the army of the founder of the 18th dynasty expelled the Hyksos rulers from Egypt, the victor's city of origin, Thebes, became the most important city in Egypt, the capital of a new dynasty. The local patron deity of Thebes, Amun, therefore became nationally important. The pharaohs of that new dynasty attributed all of their successes to Amun, and they lavished much of their wealth and captured spoil on the construction of temples dedicated to Amun. The victory against the foreign rulers achieved by pharaohs who worshipped Amun caused him to be seen as a champion of the less fortunate upholding the rights of justice for the poor. By aiding those who traveled in his name, he became the protector of the road. Since he upheld Ma'at, truth, justice, and goodness, those who prayed to Amun were required first to demonstrate that they were worthy, by confessing their sins. Vote of Steely from the Artisan's Village at Deir el Medina record. Amun, who comes at the voice of the poor in distress, who gives breath to him who is wretched. You are Amun, the Lord of the Silent, who comes at the voice of the poor, when I call to you in my distress you come and rescue me. Though the servant was disposed to do evil, the Lord is disposed to forgive. The Lord of Thebes spends not a whole day in anger, his wrath passes in a moment, none remains. His breath comes back to us in mercy. May be kind, may you forgive, it shall not happen again. The god of Windamun came to be identified with the solar god R.A. and the god of fertility and creation Min, so that Amun R.A. had the main characteristic of a solar god, creator god, and fertility god. He also adopted the aspect of the ram from the Nubian solar god, besides numerous other titles and aspects. As Amun Re, he was petitioned for mercy by those who believed suffering had come about as a result of their own or others' wrongdoing. Angedi, meaning he of Anjet, is a local ancient Egyptian deity of the Ninth Nome, centered at Anjet, which was known as Busiris to the Greeks. This deity is also known by the alternative names Anedi or Anedjdi. Angedi is considered one of the earliest Egyptian gods, possibly with roots in prehistoric Egypt. Angedi is thought to have been a precursor of Osiris. Like Osiris, he is depicted holding the crook and flail and has a crown similar to Osiris's Atef crown. Pharaoh Sneferu of the Fourth Dynasty, builder of the first true pyramid, is shown wearing the crown of Angedi. In the pyramid texts, the deceased pharaoh is identified with Angedi. In the temple of Seti I, the pharaoh is shown offering incense to Osiris Angedi who is accompanied by Isis. He also is shown to have fertility aspects, being known by the epithet of Bull of Vultures. His name is sometimes written with a substitution of a stylized uterus for the feather in the hieroglyphs. Anher was a god of war who was worshipped in the Egyptian area of Abydus, and particularly in Thinus. Myths told that he had brought his wife, Mihit, who was his female counterpart, from Nubia, and his name reflects this, it means, one who, leads back the distant one. One of his titles was Slayer of Enemies. Anher was depicted as a bearded man wearing a robe and a headdress with four feathers, holding a spear or lance, or occasionally as a lion-headed god, representing strength and power. In some depictions, the robe was more similar to a kilt. Due to his position as a war god, he was patron of the ancient Egyptian army and the personification of royal warriors. Indeed, at festivals honoring him, mock battles were staged. During the Roman era the emperor Tiberius was depicted on the walls of Egyptian temples wearing the distinctive four-plumed crown of Anher. The Greeks equated Anher to their god of war, Ares. Anher's name also could mean sky-bearer and, due to the shared headdress, Anher was later identified with Shu, becoming Anher Shu. He is the son of Are and brother of Tefnut, if identified as Shu. Anput is a goddess in ancient Egyptian religion. As the female counterpart of her husband, Anubis, 
who was known as JNPW to the Egyptians, and Poot's name ends in a feminine T suffix when seen as JNPWT. She was often depicted as a pregnant or nursing jackal, or as a jackal wielding knives. She also is depicted as a woman, with a headdress showing a jackal recumbent upon a feather, as seen in the statue of the divine triad of Hathor, Menkor, and Anput. She occasionally is depicted as a woman with the head of a jackal, but this is very rare. Anput is the female counterpart of the god Anubis. She is also a goddess of the 17th gnome of Upper Egypt. She is also considered the protector of the body of Osiris. Anubis is the god of funerary rites, protector of graves, and guide to the underworld, in ancient Egyptian religion, usually depicted as a canine or a man with a canine head. Like many ancient Egyptian deities, Anubis assumed different roles in various contexts. Depicted as a protector of graves as early as the First Dynasty, 3100, 2890 BC, Anubis was also an embalmer. By the Middle Kingdom, 2055 to 1650 BC, he was replaced by Osiris in his role as Lord of the Underworld. One of his prominent roles was as a god who ushered souls into the afterlife. He attended the weighing scale during the weighing of the heart, in which it was determined whether a soul would be allowed to enter the realm of the dead. Anubis is one of the most frequently depicted and mentioned gods in the Egyptian pantheon, however, no relevant myth involved him. Anubis was depicted in black, a color that symbolized regeneration, life, the soil of the Nile River, and the discoloration of the corpse after embalming. Anubis is associated with his brother Wepwawet, another Egyptian god portrayed with a dog's head or in canine form, but with gray or white fur. Historians assume that the two figures were eventually combined. Anubis' female counterpart is Anput. His daughter is the serpent goddess Kebeshet. Anubis is a Greek rendering of this god's Egyptian name. Before the Greeks arrived in Egypt, around the 7th century BC, the god was known as Anpu or Inpu. The root of the name in ancient Egyptian language means a royal child. Inpu has a root to inth, which means to decay. The god was also known as first of the Westerners, lord of the sacred land, he who is upon his sacred mountain, ruler of the nine bows, the dog who swallows millions, master of secrets, he who is in the place of embalming, and foremost of the divine booth. The positions that he had were also reflected in the titles he held such as he who is upon his mountain, lord of the sacred land, foremost of the Westerners, and he who is in the place of embalming. In the Old Kingdom, 2686 BC, 2181 BC, the standard way of writing his name in hieroglyphs was composed of the sound signs in pew followed by a jackal over a sign. A new form with the jackal on a tall stand appeared in the late Old Kingdom and became common thereafter. In Egypt's early dynastic period, 3100 to 2686 BC, Anubis was portrayed in full animal form, with a jackal head and body. A jackal god, probably Anubis, is depicted in stone inscriptions from the reigns of Horaha, Jur, and other pharaohs of the First Dynasty. Since pre-dynastic Egypt, when the dead were buried in shallow graves, jackals had been strongly associated with cemeteries because they were scavengers which uncovered human bodies and ate their flesh. In the spirit of fighting like with like, a jackal was chosen to protect the dead because a common problem and cause of concern must have been the digging up of bodies, shortly after burial, by jackals and other wild dogs which lived on the margins of the cultivation. In the Old Kingdom, Anubis was the most important god of the dead. He was replaced in that role by Osiris during the Middle Kingdom, 2000 to 1700 BC. In the Roman era, which started in 30 BC, tomb paintings depict him holding the hand of deceased persons to guide them to Osiris. The parentage of Anubis varied between myths, times, and sources. In early mythology, he was portrayed as a son of R.A. In the coffin texts, which were written in the first intermediate period, 2181 to 2055 BC, Anubis is the son of either the cow goddess Hesit or the cat-headed Batet. Another tradition depicted him as the son of R.A. and Nephthys. The Greek Plutarch, 40 to 120 AD, 
reported a tradition that Anubis was the illegitimate son of Nephthys and Osiris, but that he was adopted by Osiris's wife Isis. For when Isis found out that Osiris loved her sister and had relations with her in mistaking her sister for herself, and when she saw a proof of it in the form of a garland of clover that he had left to Nephthys, she was looking for a baby, because Nephthys abandoned it at once after it had been born for fear of Seth, and when Isis found the baby helped by the dogs which with great difficulties lead her there, she raised him and he became her guard and ally by the name of Anubis. In the Osiris myth, Anubis helped Isis to embalm Osiris. Indeed, when the Osiris myth emerged, it was said that after Osiris had been killed by Set, Osiris's organs were given to Anubis as a gift. With this connection, Anubis became the patron god of embalmers. During the rites of mummification, illustrations from the Book of the Dead often show a wolf mask wearing priest supporting the upright mummy. Anuket was usually depicted as a woman with a headdress of either reed or ostrich feathers she was usually depicted as holding a scepter topped with an ankh, and her sacred animal was the gazelle. She was also shown suckling the pharaoh through the new kingdom and became a goddess of lust in later years. In later periods, she was associated with the cowrie, especially the shell, which resembled the vagina. She was originally the daughter of Ra, but was always related to Satet in some way. For example, both goddesses were called the Eye of Ra, along with Batet, Hathor, and Sekhmet. Also, they were both related in some way to the Uraeus. Anuket was part of a triad with the god Khnum, and the goddess Satis. She may have been the sister of the goddess Satis, or she may have been a junior consort to Khnum instead. A temple dedicated to Anuket was erected on the island of Sihail. Inscriptions show that a shrine or altar was dedicated to her at this site by the 13th dynasty pharaoh Sobkhotep III. Much later, during the 18th dynasty, Amenhotep II dedicated a chapel to the goddess. During the New Kingdom, Anuket's cult at Elephantine included a river procession of the goddess during the first month of Shimu. Inscriptions mention the processional festival of Khnum and Anuket during this period. Ceremonially, when the Nile started its annual flood, the festival of Anuket began. People threw coins, gold, jewelry, and precious gifts into the river, in thanks to the goddess for the life-giving water and returning benefits derived from the wealth provided by her fertility. The taboo held in several parts of Egypt, against eating certain fish which were considered sacred, was lifted during this time suggesting that a fish species of the Nile was a totem for Anuket and that they were consumed as part of the ritual of her major religious festival. A Apadmak was a major deity in the ancient Nubian pantheon. Often depicted as a figure with a male human torso and a lion head, Apadmak was a war god worshipped by the Meroitic peoples inhabiting Nubia. He has no Egyptian counterpart. As a war god, a Piedmac came to symbolize martial power, military conquest, and empire for the Meroitic peoples. A Piedmac is also closely associated with Amun, the state-sponsored Egyptian deity during the preceding Napatan period, and is assumed to hold an equal level of importance. A Piedmac primarily appears during the Meroitic period. It is unknown if worship of a Piedmac as a lion god existed before. Some scholars have pointed that the worship of a lion god may be strongly rooted with Egyptian traditions dating before the New Kingdom. Nevertheless, at least by the 3rd century BCE, a Piedmac appears to have become an important deity to the peoples living in Upper Nubia. Numerous temples to a Piedmac are concentrated in the Budana region, south of the capital city of Mero. The absence of cult places to him in areas further north points to his southern origin. A Piedmac is chiefly understood as a war god. By extension, he is also considered a god of conquest and military prowess. In reliefs found in both the Lion Temple at Musawarat es Sufra and the sanctuary at Naka, a Piedmac wears leather armor or a cuirass and carries a bow and arrow in his hand, weapons that were associated with the Nubians throughout their history. Other representations show a Piedmac killing an enemy or holding a chain of an enemy captured in battle. Since a Piedmac mostly appears on reliefs in similar fashions, 
he is mostly associated with his role as a god of war. As the Meroitic god of empire, Apedmak is involved in the process of electing and legitimizing new leaders. Multiple reliefs depict kings and queens in the process of royal investiture, election, and coronation. In these scenes, Apedmak is one deity who invests the new royal by touching their elbow. Apep was seen as a giant snake or serpent leading to such titles as serpent from the Nile and evil dragon. Some elaborations said that he stretched 16 yards in length and had a head made of flint. Already on a Nakata, 4000 BCE, Seaware Bowl, now in Cairo, a snake was painted on the inside rim combined with other desert and aquatic animals as a possible enemy of a deity, possibly a solar deity, who is invisibly hunting in a big rowing vessel. The few descriptions of Apep's origin in myth usually demonstrate that it was born after R.A., usually from his umbilical cord. But Apep was commonly believed to have existed from the beginning of time in the waters of new of primeval chaos. Tales of Apep's battles against R.A. were elaborated during the New Kingdom. Storytellers said that every day Apep must lie below the horizon and not persist in the mortal kingdom. This appropriately made him a part of the underworld. In some stories, Apep waited for R.A. in a western mountain called Baku, where the sun set, and in others, Apep lurked just before dawn, in the tenth region of the night. The wide range of Apep's possible locations gained him the title World Encircler. It was thought that his terrifying roar would cause the underworld to rumble. Myths sometimes say that Apep was trapped there, because he had been the previous chief god overthrown by R.A., or because he was evil and had been imprisoned. The coffin texts imply that Apep used a magical gaze to overwhelm R.A. and his entourage. R.A. was assisted by a number of defenders who traveled with him, including Set and possibly the Eye of R.A. Apep's movements were thought to cause earthquakes, and his battles with Set may have been meant to explain the origin of thunderstorms. In one account, R.A. himself defeats Apep in the form of a cat. Ra's victory each night was thought to be ensured by the prayers of the Egyptian priests and worshippers at temples. The Egyptians practiced a number of rituals and superstitions that were thought to ward off a pep and aid R.A. in continuing his journey across the sky. In an annual rite called the Banishing of Chaos, priests would build an effigy of a pep that was thought to contain all of the evil and darkness in Egypt and burn it to protect everyone from a pep's evil for another year. Apis was pictured with the sun disk symbol of his mother, Hathor, between his horns, being one of few deities ever associated with her symbol. When the disk was depicted on his head with his horns below and the triangular marking on his forehead, an ank was suggested. That symbol always was closely associated with Hathor. Early on, Apis was the herald of Ta, the chief deity in the area around Memphis. As a manifestation of Ta, Apis also was considered to be a symbol of the king, embodying the qualities of kingship. In the region where Ta was worshipped, cattle exhibited white patterning on their mainly black bodies, and so a belief grew up that the Apis calf had to have a certain set of markings suitable to its role. It was required to have a white triangular marking upon its forehead, a white Egyptian vulture wing outline on its back, a scarab mark under its tongue, a white crescent moon shape on its right flank, and double hairs on his tail. The calf that matched these markings was selected from the herds, brought to a temple, given a harem of cows, and worshipped as an aspect of Ta. The cow who was his mother was believed to have conceived him by a flash of lightning from the heavens, or from moonbeams. She also was treated specially, and given a special burial. At the temple, Apis was used as an oracle, his movements being interpreted as prophecies. His breath was believed to cure disease and his presence to bless those around with strength. A window was created in the temple through which he could be viewed and, on certain holidays, he was led through the streets of the city, bedecked with jewelry and flowers. The apis was a protector of the deceased and linked to the pharaoh. Horns embellish some of the tombs of ancient pharaohs and apis often was depicted on private coffins as a powerful protector. As a form of Osiris, ruler of the underworld, 
it was believed that to be under the protection of Apis would give the person control over the four winds in the afterlife. Aten was the focus of Atenism, the religious system formally established in ancient Egypt by the late 18th dynasty pharaoh Amenhotep IV, better known as Akhenaten. Exact dating for the 18th dynasty is contested, though a general date range places the dynasty in the years 1550 to 1292 BC. The worship of Aten and the coinciding rule of Akhenaten are major identifying characteristic of a period within the 18th dynasty referred to as the Amarna period 1353 to 1336 BC. Atenism and the worship of the Aten as the sole god of ancient Egypt state worship did not persist beyond Akhenaten's death. Not long after his death, one of Akhenaten's 18th dynasty successors, Tutankhamun, reopened the state temples to other Egyptian gods and repositioned Amun as the preeminent solar deity. The cult center of the Aten was at the capital city Akhenaten founded, Akhetaten, though other cult sites have been found in Thebes and Heliopolis. The use of Amarna as a capital city and religious center was relatively short-lived compared to the 18th dynasty or New Kingdom as a whole as it was shortly abandoned after the death of Akhenaten. Inscriptions found on boundary stela, accredited to Akhenaten, discuss his desire to make the city a place of worship to Aten, dedicating the city to the god and emphasizing the royal residence's efforts in worship. Major principles of the Aten's cult worship were recorded via inscriptions on temples and tombs from the period. Straying significantly from the tradition of ancient Egyptian temples being hidden and more enclosed the further one went into the site, temples of Aten were open and did not have roofs in order to allow the rays of the sun inside. No statues of Aten were allowed as they were seen as idolatry. However, these were typically replaced by functionally equivalent representations of Akhenaten and his family venerating the Aten and receiving the ink, the breath of life, from him. Compared to periods before and after the Amarna period, priests had less to do since offerings, such as fruits, flowers, cakes, were limited and oracles were not needed. 